this is the medicine for the soul, nothing else. Failure to bring forth this medicine means there is no cure and you are dead in your sins and you will remain there. That is the danger of churches deciding, well, it's too dangerous for me to open my mouth. Open your mouth, God will protect you. Open your mouth if it means that it might be your last breath. When we encounter in the Bible the word mystery, or plural, mysteries, uh, which is predominantly, I believe, solely and singularly used in the New Testament, uh, if you look up in the Strong's Concordance the words I just referenced, um, mystery or mysteries, uh, you find that you've got some different applications. For example, in Ephesians 1.9, it says, having made known to us the mystery of his will. And I use that for emphasis, his will. In other places, Paul says that the one that speaks in an unknown tongue, no man understandeth him. However, in the spirit, he speaketh mysteries. Another concept. So when we have this word appear, we should be careful to look at it and understand it in the setting, in the context in which it appears. If you're interested, the word mystery appears 22 times in its plural form and five times in the singular in the New Testament. And while the music was playing, I just to solve my, I knew the Greek word is mysterion, but if you're interested, it's Strong's number 3466, uh, mysterion from a derivative of muo. It says to shut the mouth, a secret or mystery through the idea of silence imposed by initiation into religious rites or mystery and so on and so forth. So you get the idea of what's being said. Um, the reason why I am focusing on this today is because I think that there are things in God's book. There's an awful lot of pressure on me and I think any minister who's constantly presenting messages, new material. When I say new, I'm not just regurgitating something I did last week or last year. Um, there's this pressure to constantly um, pull a new something out of the hat. So let's just get this one straight. There, there isn't anything new. It's all old and yet to be discovered. It can become new to us as we discover it, but there isn't anything new that's going to come out of this book that's a new revelation that we didn't have already given to us. That's number one. Um, but I also believe that there are things that God is not going to reveal completely to us until an appointed time. And I'm hoping that this message will carefully demonstrate that in a way where maybe some will have a better understanding that even though we have the complete Old and New Testament, we study it, there are things that even to us will not become known while we're still yet in these bodies. So, bear with me. The, three, the reason why I introduced the word mystery is it actually fits into three different texts that are all speaking about the same thing. Um, in Luke, I'm sorry, in Matthew 13, in the 13th chapter, um, I believe there we have it in I'll begin in the 13th chapter at verse 10. The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not shall be taken away from him, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing hear not, neither they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and ye shall not understand. Seeing ye shall see, and ye shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, 
and they should understand with their heart, should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, they see, and your ears, they hear cell phones. <laughs> For they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear these things which ye hear but have not heard them. And he goes on to address the parable of the sower, which I'm, I'm almost inclined to rename the parable of the soil, but hold that thought for a second. So in this particular passage, in verse 11, he says, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Hold that thought. In Mark 4, 11, you've got the parallel passage. And the only change here, carefully, he sa it says, and when he was alone, they that were about with the twelve asked him the parable. And he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to un unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. And basically goes on to say the same thing. What I find remarkable, and you'll find the same passage in Luke 8.10, you don't have to turn there, but the point is whether we're talking about, and I've taught on this before, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, the concept is that Jesus says to his disciples, unto you it is given to understand these things, and yet I want you to take note of something. He still had to explain to them what the parables meant. He still had to explain it to them. And what I find equally interesting is that I believe it is in um, Matthew. In Matthew, I believe right towards the end of that passage, uh, 13 and verse 51, Jesus saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? And they say unto him, Yea, Lord. Now I ask you, it's a rhetorical question because of those of us who are very familiar with the Gospels, he asks them, do you understand all this? And they say, yes, but we know definitively that they did not. See, this is what I'm kind of latching on to. Even though he explained the parables to them, he asks them, but we know, and I'll get to this in a later point, we know that they themselves did not understand. And it'll only become clear everything that was told to them will become clear, really, if you think about it, on the day of Pentecost and going forward. Prior to that event of Pentecost, it was as though, huh, we don't know. I mean, periodically, if you remember, Peter shouts out at Caesarea Philippi, thou art the Christ. Jesus says to him, flesh and blood hath not revealed this thing to you. And by the next breath, saying one declaration of you, thou art the Christ. And the next breath, when Jesus begins to talk about death dying in the cross, oh, no, Lord, be it far from you. No, no, that can't happen, which tells you they didn't understand the full mission of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They just did not, even though it was told to them. So there are things that Jesus tried to reveal. He spoke to them. But there are also things that he spoke that were concealed and were meant to be made known, opened up, ushered in at a set time. And I just gave you that example that if you're reading, you can kind of see they don't really get the point of a lot of these things until a specific time. But there's something that our Lord says, nestled in uh, Matthew 13, that caught my attention to prove the point even further. And that is, he says, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith by hearing you won't hear. He's quoting Isaiah and saying, in them, by through what the words of what Isaiah said, this thing is fulfilled. That got me to go back and take a look at that sixth chapter of Isaiah with purpose. So turn with me to the sixth chapter of Isaiah. And I'd like to show you something which I think will make clear several things to consider 
when we're trying to say we desire, we hunger after knowledge of the things of God, but sometimes not everything is given to us in one moment. God has set time. So Isaiah 6 opens with this incredible image. Uh, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. He sees seraphims. They had, uh, each one had six wings. Twain covered his face, or two covering the face, two covering the feet, and twain to fly. Kind of a very interesting scenario. One cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. So it's an incredible scene. And then Isaiah speaks, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And one of the, uh, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which had taken with the tongs off the altar, laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away, thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then, of course, it kind of sounds silly to us, but Isaiah saying, Here I am, send me. And that sounds reasonable for somebody desiring to do the Lord's bidding, except the Lord says, Okay, if you're going to go, this is what you're going to tell them. Go and tell them this, this people. Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat. Make their ears heavy. Shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the house is without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord hath removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a teal tree, as an oak, whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Let me explain a few things here to make this clear before I can get to where I need to go. Isaiah is preaching. We just came off a whole series, a half a year of the lost tribes. Isaiah's preaching occurs before the northern kingdom has been carried away. But his admonitions will be to warn primarily the southern kingdom. He, his ministry was for 40 years through four Judean kings. But this is very particular, and I, I want you to think about this. The commission is for him to go and preach, but no one's going to receive the message. No one's going to hear. In fact, God will harden their hearts, make it so they can't hear, they can't understand, they cannot receive. And a person might say, well, why would God send somebody if his intent is not to open up the eyes and the ears that people may receive? And the answer to that question is very simple. The answer to that question is, number one, for decades, centuries, God had been giving grace and mercy to tell people to turn back to him, to commit themselves to him and commit their ways to him, to follow him. And we know the history of the, the people in general. So God used uh, both the Assyrian army and the Babylonian uh, forced to do his bidding, basically to make come to pass the prophecies that were uttered concerning the northern and southern kingdoms. But Isaiah is ministering a good time before the north is taken away. So it's almost as though God was still, even though he says they won't hear, they won't receive, they can't, it's almost as though God was saying, I'm going to send out the messenger not, no longer to get people to repent. I'm going to send out my messenger with basically the hopes, if they can't hear, they're going to become hardened because judgment is coming. That is the gist of this. There was enough time in times past for people to repent, for people to turn around, for people to stop their folly of whatever they were doing in disobedience. 
and follow God, but this time was up. So God had already committed that this is what he's going to do. So that was a freebie, all right. Uh, <laughs> but there's a correction that needs to be made here. And it says in your King James, but yet in it shall be a tenth and it shall return. And then the King James says, and it shall be eaten. That's a terrible uh, translation. Actually, the Hebrew, if you read it, it says it shall be burned. So think about the destruction of the city. It shall be burned. And then this is a little bit chaotic here um, when it says, as a teal tree and as an oak whose substance is in them, when they cast their leaves, imagine trees that are barren are fuel for the fire, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. That's a very cryptic message, but what it's saying is although everything will be reduced to ashes out of basically out of what is left, the, the seed that will come, Christ will come out of, will rise out of these ashes, essentially. That's what this verse is saying. When people do not know how much um, prophetic weaving there is, again, you can read something and not understand there's deep meaning in each and every one of these texts. And I'd say, go so far as to say, with unfortunate translations where you sometimes can't even, reading it, understand what it means because the English version has not done justice to the original. Sometimes that's the problem. But my point here is this. Um, God is telling Isaiah, go and preach to these people. But he's not going to preach to warn them, hey, turn around, repent, the time has come. He's going to preach to them and they're not going to be able to receive the message. In fact, I I'd stop right here and say there are, there are times when I think in this modern day and age, there, there are people that are basically like this passage right here. They cannot hear, they cannot see. It, it reminds me of uh, something in the past when you think about it. Do you remember what God said to Moses concerning Pharaoh? Keep going back, keep asking, but what did God do? He hardened. Pharaoh's heart. And the hardening of Pharaoh's heart was to accomplish a purpose. The dimming and dulling of the ears and the eyes was to accomplish a purpose, but the purpose wasn't going to be rescue effort, you're all going to be saved. It was basically, I've had enough, enough's enough, and I'm going to start cleaning house. So you might say, well, was that a mystery when Isaiah started preaching to the people? Was it a mystery to the people? I believe it was, because they couldn't understand. And in fact, if you look at Isaiah carefully, you have from basically the beginning of Isaiah in the first few chapters, you've got a picture of a nation fallen into sin. And by the, uh, let's see, by the fifth chapter, you have a parable. It's the parable of the vineyard. vineyard. So I don't think it's an accident when Christ quoted things that were previously said, there's also the context in which it was said, which becomes very important. It's not just, hey, I'm going to, this was a good saying a couple of hundred years ago. I'm going to lift it up and I'm going to just repeat it because it sounds good. There's purpose. So if we think about the people in Isaiah's day, they would have been receiving a message that technically speaking was concealed. And when would it become known to them at the appointed time? That appointed time would be when God said, I'm sending in first the Assyrians. You can start, go back and say first the Chaldeans, then the Assyrians, then the Babylonians. That would be the appointed time where people would go, holy cow, God wasn't joking. That's what, that's what was being said back there. Now, you might think initially this is just a bunch of theological jargon here, but it's not, because it not only helps us to understand a lot of times things that are being said in the Bible are in part, if you will. They're being revealed to us in part. They're in front of us. But the fullness thereof will be revealed at a set time and at a pointed time, much like, for example, in the prophecies foretelling 
of Messiah and the coming of Christ. But th these things were being foretold, and yet at the appointed time, God brought forth his only begotten son in a tent of human flesh. So things that were being said, even in prophecy regarding the coming of Christ, might have been seemed presented as concealed until the set appointed time where God said, now it can be made known, made plain, understood. So I think a lot of times what happens is people want to read the Bible and they expect to find every single angle, every single precept, every single everything to where everything can be explained, everything can be known. But that's just not true. It's like the people who insist on saying the Lord's return will be and they'll set a date and really make um, a genius out of themselves, <laughs> right? Because the Bible clearly says no man knoweth what exactly. So if you can imagine that, that's, that's, that is how sometimes we get caught up. We think we can know but we can't. We, we, are, we are much like the people in Isaiah's day, except the ears are not covered over, receiving all this information. And I guess the idea, we're not under judgment. The idea is that we should anticipate a time, a set time, an appointed time, when the things that we don't yet understand or are not yet clear will be revealed. And why I'm going down this pathway now is if you... Go back, and let's just take the passage out of, we'll try first out of Mark, Mark 4. So if you go back, and now let's see if we can kind of put this together to make this a little bit more understandable, because I've just tried to set the framework for the message. So Mark 4, he began again to teach by the seaside. There was a gathering there was gathered unto him a great multitude so that he entered into a ship, sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on land. And he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine. Now, I want to make clear that he will say this multiple times. He would only speak to the multitudes in parables. And then the disciples will come to him and they'll ask kind of for clarification. And he explains it to them, to his disciples. And don't, by the way, make the mistake of thinking uh, limited. When we say disciples, typically it means those uh, 12, depending on the time we're looking at, but it would still be 12. Don't limit it to that. Think about there were women that followed Jesus. There were other people, we'll call them in the inner circle, that are not necessarily the celebrities, known names, but there was, a, there was a large enough inner circle, and then there were the people on the outside. So to that inner circle, he would exposit, elaborate, make known. But keep in mind, even though he did that, it still did not become crystal clear. The other thing I want you to notice is that if you read through the parables, the parables say a lot of things like, and the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is likened to we never read in the parables, we never read, Jesus never gave any parabolic method of explaining his death. It's not in there. The kingdom of heaven is like unto, and he compares it to um, a field or a pearl. He makes all these comparisons, but he never, there's never a complete, you'd think, if you're going to talk in parables and say something cryptic, you'd talk about the most important event of your life, but he doesn't for a reason. And I can tell you what that reason is. He knew just by the behavior of the people around him, he knew that they could not understand and they would not be able to process what he was saying, that he would have to go and die. That would not make sense. And if you think about it, the people flocked to see Christ when he was feeding, when he was teaching, and when he began to speak of the cross, psh, people take off and flee. So there are, there's a whole bunch of little sub-lessons here. I don't want to lose the big picture. The big picture is that sometimes 
we as students of the Bible have to recognize there are set times even for us to be able to see and understand deeply and maybe they will only be completely in a future time. But probably a second point to that, which is real important, is that most people want the Jesus life without Jesus death and resurrection. People want that, the idea that they want the resurrected life, but they don't want to have to see, look, or talk about cross or dying to self. So it's very clear to me that when we get into this passage, and I said I would, I would often refer to this as the parable of the sower, but I'm today thinking maybe it should be called better the parable of the soil, because essentially by explaining the first parable to his disciples, he says if you, actually he's giving the first parable and says if you can't understand this, you can't understand anything else. And I want you to just, I know it's kind of silly because you've probably read the parables a bazillion times, but I want you to think about if you were the disciples or the listening audience, and he's basically saying, if you can't get this, this first one, this first explanation, you're not going to understand anything else. It won't make sense to you. Now you'd think, because he's teaching them, I'll, at least for the benefit of my audience that may or may not have a Bible in front of them, read a portion of this, uh, which is quite familiar to this congregation. He taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. It came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. And when the sun was up, uh, it was scorched because it had no root, it withered away. Some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it and yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprung up and increased and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some hundred. And he says, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, they that were about with the twelve, asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all that outer circle of people over there, okay, all these things are done in parables. That seeing, they may see. He's quoting, this is, the full quote is in Matthew, but it is still the quote of Isaiah. That seeing they may see and not perceive, hearing they may they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sin should be forgiven them. So he goes on to explain, he says, know you not this parable, then how you know all the parables? How will you understand the rest of it, right? And he goes on to explain, the sower soweth the word, and these that are by the, the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately, taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts, and these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves, and so endure, but for a time and afterward when affliction or persecution ariseth, for the word's sake immediately they are offended. And these are they, these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts, of other things entering in, choke the word and become, becometh unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, sixty, and some a hundred. Now, what I, what I want to point out immediately, and this is what's interesting, you might ask the question, the time of Isaiah's day is finished. The judgment upon those people was meted out. So why is Jesus saying this essentially to the outer circle? He's not, he's explaining it to the insiders, but why is he saying this to the outer circle of people? And this is what I want to focus on because it becomes something very relevant for us. See if you can follow to make this application with me. The parables were used to conceal the meaning to the multitudes. 
And you might ask, why? Because even unto these people, judgment still had to come. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, the judgment, and I want you to really, it's a stretch for some because if you're not familiar with the scriptures, this might be difficult. But we tend to think when we think about our Lord going to the cross and we, we personalize it and we say the Lord died on the cross and shed his blood for me. And you, I've always said, change John 3.16, God so loved the world, and, but don't say the world, say put your name in there, that he gave his only begotten son. But that's only one side of understanding the complete work of atonement. The other side is understood by way of Isaiah 53 when it says the Lord laid upon him. Remember, it's still Old Testament. The iniquity of us all, which means that not only would Jesus die for the sins, which is what John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. But not only did Jesus go and die for our sins, present living people, but he also had to receive upon him the judgment due Think about this. Since the beginning of a disobedient, basically gainsaying, stiff-necked people who thought that by the prescribed sacrifices in basically checking the box that they would be cleansed, that was God's prescription for some time. But the reality is, and the book of Hebrews declares, that the blood of bulls and goats could not cleanse the conscience, it took something greater, a great sacrifice once and for all. So when you think about it, Jesus' final atoning work on the cross is not just for us. We have this myopic view, he died for me. But I want you to think foremost, go behind yourself before you ever came into existence. If you're reading Isaiah 53, judgment had to be laid completely upon him for the sins past present and future, but think of Isaiah 53 at the time of that writing, and let's just kind of put a, a timeline. I'm just going to say this. It's not a correct exact time, but say put this in the uh, 800s, maybe um, somewhere in the 800s BC. I want you to think about that, that passage, which is basically foretelling about the fact that the suffering servant Messiah would go to die on the cross. It's explained if you want to see it juxtaposed old and new, Isaiah 53, with what the Gospels reveal, but there had to be satisfaction for a nation, not just that God scattered them to the wind that one day he'll bring them back and we'll all be reunited, but judgment had to be meted out, and how did the ultimate satisfaction to the penalty of the sin that had occurred to this people, how would this be satisfied in God's eyes, Jesus going to die at the cross. So the message that Jesus is basically declaring when he's declaring all of these parables of the kingdom, think long and hard about why he would say to his disciples, unto you it is given to understand, to know, to receive, but unto all these other people. I'm going to speak in parables. And, and there is a passage, I believe, um, it is in Mark, and if you turn to 433, and with many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it, as they were able to hear it, which means to the degree that they were able to receive it, which is probably not that great. But without a parable spake he not unto them, and when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. So it's as if Jesus, by quoting Isaiah, is communicating something that's yet, yet to happen, even though he's not talking anywhere about his death at this point. But he's talking about the kingdom being ushered in. Well, how, let me ask you this question, it's really not a rhetorical one. How would the kingdom be ushered in don't think it was just because Jesus came in the flesh and therefore the kingdom was there. Remember the words of John the Baptist. He said, repent, the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is nigh. Essentially meaning until God 
basically, pardon the language, pulled the trigger for the set time for Jesus to go to the cross and die. Judgment which would be poured out on him. We know what happened at Calvary. But until that time, these people would not know. They would not understand. And even his disciples, it was not made clear until not just that he went to die. It was only made clear when he showed himself in resurrected form. The vindication of God saying, I'm going to do this to show you, to demonstrate that this is now going to be the way that from this act of judgment, salvation comes. No longer the old way. And why am I trying to point this out? Because it seems very simple to me that if you take the connection I'm making, Jesus' disciples could not, they couldn't handle the truth if they were told in advance, even though he says it multiple times, at least three times in Mark, I must go and die. And at least two out of those three times, it's like they all had Muzak piped into their ears. <laughs> they heard nothing. Oh, well, okay, that's great. Except for the last time. And if we can flip the narrative a little bit to show you how much, even when things are revealed to us, remember, he's speaking to them in parables, the outer circle people, okay? They would have, that outer circle people, they would have made him king and ushered in the kingdom their way when they saw him feeding the multitudes. They would have ushered in their version of the kingdom, lack of understanding, not the set point, not the set time. This is why Jesus, you keep seeing him like an escape artist, slipping out of places and disappearing. Until the time, the appointed time, the set time, it's like saying Jesus could not die on any other night or any other day except for that set day. And then that, by virtue of that set time happening, basically, we now are able to have the revelation of, basically, of God's righteousness in resurrected form put on display for all to see, but until that time, concealed. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Good, because I think I'm talking to alien language. I see a lot of people going, yeah. okay. All right, so... I go back to this question again. Um, if Jesus is using Isaiah's technique, then it suggests to me that two things, the outer circle of people, they were destined to not understand until an appointed time, which might have been, like I said, when the news of Jesus' resurrection starts to spread, you don't hear of massive amounts of people. Until, until Pentecost arrives, you don't hear of massive amounts of people gathering. In fact, it's a little band that's hiding for fear that they might be seen, get caught around Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, who's not supposed to be resurrected based on all the rumors that are being spread. So it becomes clear to me that this whole concept that Jesus is using to speak in a parabolic way is also applicable to us in this time. And let me now explain, and hopefully I can make sense of this for you. I think because people get so familiar with the Bible, they, most people, would like to put everything in neat little boxes and have nice timelines and dates so that they can check a box. But there are some things that will not be revealed to us, they will remain concealed. And there's a reason in our age, there's a reason for that. It's called faith. See, if everything is revealed, if everything's completely laid out, why do you need faith? And the, the words that are written in this book, when the Son of Man returneth, when the Son of God comes back to earth, will he find faith? So this is why God is basically not revealing, not giving, not but it should create something in the heart of every believer today. And this, I think, is the thing, I'm just going to say it, that I think is lacking. It's not just lacking here. It's lacking everywhere. Anticipation 
of God making good on the things he has declared will happen in the future, specifically. You know how often I have conversations with people and I ask them about Christ's return, and these are people that read the Bible. And, well, I, yeah, I, don't, I just don't know. Huh? I mean, if you don't know, then I don't know either because my Bible t clearly tells me he's coming back. Old and New Testament both declare his return. So the question then needs to be asked. Why, if we have all this information in front of us, why did God not just kind of spell all this out so we could basically check the box, get on with it, and say, okay, we know he's coming then, so we can all be busy and do whatever we need to do until that day, and then on that day we can all get our Sunday suits on and get on our knees and start praying because the Lord's here. It's, it's the Lord's day, right? That's the preparation you'd all like to have? That's my point. God gave that opportunity to the children of Israel, north and south. He gave them the opportunity abundantly. If you think about it, to them, oral transmission, it was told to them, it was repeated generation after generation about the deliverance out of Egypt's bondage, which included telling the miracles that God did through his mouthpiece, Moses. So what a tragedy that, let's just say that the New Testament had not yet been ushered in. We were living in the Old Testament times. And we had knowledge, our forefathers, several generations back, walked, liberated, out of Egypt, under the hand of God, under the guidance of God, knowing all these things, and yet, if you look at the history of God's people, time only makes them more disobedient and more stiff-necked, more complacent, more lazy, more in discord and disagreement with God's word. And look, by the way, look where we are now, okay? It's not as though we like to talk about evolution. No, we've really evolved then, right? Because as far as I'm concerned, we have stepped back beyond just look at our, the spirituality of our country has stepped back beyond the Dark Ages. You'd be better off, you'd have more enlightenment in the Dark Ages than what people are living in today with no anticipation. But that's where we're at. And my point is, if you don't think that we are in the place essentially where the people in Isaiah's day were, not all, because the Bible, the New Testament, Romans 8 says, there is therefore no ultimate condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It means you're not going to suffer the judgment that would be of those who have refused and rejected. That is covered. You're covered by the blood. There isn't, you don't have to be afraid. You trust in him. It's enough. But I'm asking you, are we not in a state right now there are still ministers like myself, and there are maybe there are pockets, and there may be not everywhere, of people still preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's falling on deaf ears. And people would like to say, oh, well, it's because, and they want to give every reason. But if one understands theologically that God is the one who stirs the soul, that God, look at the parable of the sower who sows the seed, who brings the, the fruit, who lets things grow, or who chokes things off. And you want to try and blame somewhere else. Oh, it's, it's not interesting, it's old, it's archaic, but I hate to tell you the people in this day and age are exactly in the place of the people of Isaiah's day because Isaiah was trying to preach and warn them, but they couldn't hear they couldn't receive it. And the design here is to say, I believe we're kind of in that same phase. There are people who, preaching, there's the word going out somewhere in the world, not just from this pulpit. So you tell me, if God is not preparing once more to mete out judgment upon the earth, because if you know the history of the church, beginning Go to the very beginning in this book, in the New Testament, as the church starts. Essentially, it cannot be contained. The growth and the spread of Christianity is like a contagion. It just it spreads like wildfire. 
And then, of course, it is, we'll call it muffled by dark ages, by perverse and crooked people who try to make it into a money machine. And that continues on for, what, a thousand plus years, still going on today. But the point is that the message, the message, if it's being preached, and that's part of the problem, if the message is being preached, it should still have the same power. It's not, the power is not in the speaker. The power doesn't come from the person. The power comes from God and his word. Should still have the power to be able to take people where they're at, open their eyes, open their ears, get them to hear, and get them thinking, yeah, I, I need to know more about this. So you tell me, I already said churches taking up the social banner or taking up, a, we'll call it the... The, to the degree that I find it ridiculous, for example, um, some Protestant denominations have already splintered because of the insistence on pushing certain sexual preferences or tendencies right into the pulpit and saying, now, you, you, you must accept this. When God says, I reject it, I refuse, I will not. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like, it's like just heaping up more coals. That, to me, says we are not done yet. And people think, oh, the end will come and it'll be something, you know, it can't be like the Bible says. There can't be this violence that occurs on the earth, this terrible final chapter that occurs on the earth with basically a lot of death, a lot of blood, a lot of people, things that were alive on the earth that will no longer be. Again, once more, that is the judgment that must come. That is the wrath of God that must be poured out once more. Not that Christ has to die again. His death once and for all sufficed. But the concept is we are back in the day of people not being able, and I believe deliberately now, not being able to hear, not being able to receive, because I think we've reached that point. Are there people listening? Are there people receiving? Yes, there are, but I'd say a greater portion of people are not able to hear anymore. Now, if it's solely because the church has lost its way and it's not doing its part, as I said, God's word has the power to draw, has the power to fix, uh, if you want to say what is broken, to heal that which is sick, to raise up that which is lame, to give understanding where there is not, to give knowledge, to give wisdom. So it's really important for us to take a page out of this to say, if Jesus, quoting Isaiah, using a reference point, was speaking to his disciples and the outer circle, imagine now where we are at. I don't think that there is a large majority of people anticipating Christ's return. I don't think that there is a large majority of people on the face of the earth that are looking unto him to solve their problems, to bring their despair, to bring their sickness, to bring whatever it is to him. We have become a quick fix, get it done now. We don't need to wait on things. We don't need to agonize in prayer. We don't need to read this book. We don't even need to listen to a preacher because guess what? You can Google it, and you can know the answer for yourself. And that, by the way, I'm not, I'm not mocking people who try to do their own studies. I'm actually very appreciative when people try. The fact of the matter is that a lot of times doing it on your own is quite difficult, and that is just a fact. That's just put that down as so. So what I would like the takeaway to uh, be for this message so that I can weave this as clear as possible this should be a warning. And, you know, you, if you're listening to me, you might say, well, but I, I already believe and trust and faith in the Lord Jesus. Then the message isn't for you. How's that? The message is for those people who might actually tune into this program and think, uh, there's no hurry, I don't have to think about this. Uh, or this is all silliness, you know, this business of the church and how people like to talk about salvation well, if you go back to the text in Isaiah where it says it all had to be burned down, and I use the expression colloquially of saying that 
basically Jesus would come out of the ashes because God had reserved that specific appointed time for the coming of our Lord and Savior. If you think about it in that way, it becomes important to understand that there are yet appointed times to become realized, that we haven't seen it all, and that yes, if you think about it, as things are speeding up, it is what the Bible says in the last days, men will be lovers, and I say men generically, the Bible reads it like that, but people will be lovers of themselves, they'll be scoffers, deceivers. When people say, what's the point of the church? And it's done in a mocking fashion. Why do you, why do you get up Sunday morning to go to church? There is your answer right there of what people will be like in the last days. They ridicule you for your faith in God because their God is a God of their making. It's just like the Old Testament. Make anything you want, deify it, and it can bring you no harm because you made it with your own hands. You control it. That is the essence of what is going on. But if you read between the lines, it's almost like saying we have a warning. And the warning isn't simply just, oh, we're, we're, we're looking for him every day for his return. It's saying anticipation or anticipating in faith for things to come to fruition, and they will guarantee something. It doesn't guarantee the ride's going to be smooth. It doesn't guarantee a lot of it. What it does guarantee is that when God finally says, this is the appointed time, you and I will know that we have stood on a word of promise made good. A few minutes ago I said that judgment had to be meted out on Christ using the reference of Isaiah 53, the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. This is why Paul could write in the book of Ephesians concerning what he spoke of as a mystery, that the wall of partition had been broken down between Jew and Gentile, that they had been reconciled back to one another, and this begins this interesting concept of they won't hear, they can't hear, they can't receive. Because the work of salvation, listen carefully when people say, what about our Jewish friends? What about our Jewish brothers and sisters? The work of salvation was done there at the cross for them too. They won't hear, they won't receive to this day, still like that. I want you to think about this. There is great wisdom in looking at both the passage of Isaiah and the passage that is then mentioned in the New Testament to recognize we are in, still in a period where don't think somehow that there's going to be this magical time. I've heard people say, we will shift the pendulum and a great revival will come and there'll be an incredible resurgence of, no. There won't be. It'll be the strengthening of the faith that those who already believe will be made greater. Those who cannot hear will not hear. And those who are somewhere left, what I say preveniently, by God's grace, if the word is still being preached somewhere on the face of this planet, they can receive and be saved. So it tells me that we're still in a time building up to a, a final time of justice, of judgment upon the earth, the wrath of God being poured out. We know the book of Revelation declares an event that will catastrophically affect the earth before God can recreate a new heaven and a new earth. So it's always this same pattern. God always seemingly has to tear down to build back up again. And I believe this is the final phase leading up to the great and final day of tearing down. That tells me that the church, the few pastors, preachers, ministers, wherever you are who listen to me, do not be persuaded to stop preaching the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Do not be afraid that the government says you cannot speak these words anymore. God is greater than any person who says you can't read this book Render to Caesar, which is what belongs to Caesar's. But this book and its word belongs to the people who can hear, can receive. So for those people out there to say, well, I'm, I'm afraid, I don't, my, my ministry, or God's not the author of fear. Stand strong, preach the word, be instant in season. Remember why God called you out of the ashes to stand as a lighthouse 
for a lost world that seems even more lost in this day and age and to the people who are listening. And I don't care, as I said, if you listen to me or you don't listen to me, find someone who is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ that you can focus your attention on, set your heart on, will feed your soul by the word of God and fortify and strengthen you that in the day and when that day comes, you are standing as a solid pillar of faith unmoved, unshaken by whatever the world and anything that happens on this old sinful planet will not affect you in your standing because you are standing on something that is solid, unmovable, unbreakable, unshakable. And this is the medicine for the soul, nothing else. Failure to bring forth this medicine means there is no cure and you are dead in your sins and you will remain there. That is the danger of churches deciding, well, it's too dangerous for me to open my mouth. Open your mouth, God will protect you. Open your mouth if it means that it might be your last breath. But don't be silent about the things that God desires for us to do, which is preach, encourage, Specifically, the Word of God bringing faith that in these last days, instead of being lovers of self and finding everything that we can think good and decent about ourselves, we are simply people that have great understanding, looking unto Him who is the author and finisher of faith. He has completed this work for us. All we have to do is be faithful in following Him. It doesn't mean perfect. It means anticipation, he is coming back, and faith that says, regardless of what happens, I'm not taking my eyes off of him. He came to save me. I'm not letting go. I am not letting go. Maybe some of you out there will figure out you might have let go a little bit. Grab yourself by the bootstraps and begin to walk in faith again and say, I am not letting go no matter what comes my way. The word of God is true. I'm going to stand by it no matter what. It becomes God's problem after that because I've rested and trusted him. I am, it's now his problem and I'm now his problem because I'm resting and trusting in him. And that's not a bad problem to have. So I hope that at least with this message, I can stir people up to say, don't think that every mystery in the Bible is going to be revealed to you. And in this lifetime, you're going to know and understand everything. But the things that we can know and we can receive by faith should instill in us the greater concept that we must still keep even building the faith and anticipation of when he does return and he is coming back. I will tell you that. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.